Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Person. Fellow activists, ladies and gentlemen, fellow members of the panel, someone asked me quite some time ago, what is this human rights all about? And uh, it got me thinking from John Locke to uh, the UN Charter, the International Covenants and all that. So at the strike of that moment, I just have to sh shake my head. But in practicing human rights, I always adopt a simplified humanistic approach. So I told him, human rights is something about knocking at someone's door. However, you have to fulfill or overcome two hurdles. That someone that I'm talking about is sleeping inside. He's fast asleep. And the other thing is the door is locked, so you cannot get in. So you got to keep knocking and knocking. And that someone will be so frustrated because he's in deep sleep. You will say, oh, please don't disturb me and all that. Why don't you come another time? But you have to keep knocking again and say, I told you not to keep knocking. You come another time. And then can't you see I'm sleeping and all that. But actually, that person can't see. And uh, you just keep knocking and all that. And finally, the person came reluctantly open the door and he sees you for the dignity of what you are. And that person came to an awakening. Ladies and gentlemen, that context which I'm setting out is what I'm going to begin my discourse with you this afternoon. And the first point would be to talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights within the context of knocking the door. It assumes that the minimum achievement standards are sufficient to protect cultural minorities. Explanation. Now, when the UDHR was formulated, it did not mention about minority or minority rights, but it did came up historically in the League of Nations and uh, it was about protection of a smaller group. Now because of the intervening years and world war, lessons were learned that it could be taken as a pretext by Nazi Germany to, as a cover for aggression. So in a sense, it was not mentioned. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the fact that it's not mentioned doesn't mean it is not important. It is believed that the assumption of minority, minority rights could be resolved and could be addressed upon the assumption that human rights standards, minimum achievement standards can be used to resolve minority rights. And to further ex expand on the matter, the UN was in a position to clarify, and based on Article 2, uh, no, before that, I still have something to say on Article 2. It talks something about non-discrimination. We have to be treated equally, things like that. And it says so in so many words. I think most of us here are quite familiar with that. So that is the most basic point. And the most important provision would be Article 27 of the International Covenants of Civil and Political Rights, which provides that in those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minori minorities shall not be denied the right in community with other members of their group. Meaning, in simple terms, you have to live together and then you've got to try to establish relationships 
so on and so forth. So in so many words about minority, minority rights, and if we were to look at the framework, this imposes on states a duty of non-interference with rights of such person, but not a duty to assist. Okay, then we go down where this morning we talk about 1992, a declaration on the rights of persons belonging to national or ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. Now that point has been uh, expanded upon by the expert, Ms. Rita. I will not go into that. Uh, but this will be the, the framework, the beginning of the whole picture. And of course, within the local context, uh, Article 1 before that, provides that, Article 1 of the 1992 provides that states shall protect. So there is a further added uh, provision or clarification. This time protection comes in. You have to protect the existence and the national, ethnic, cultural, religious, and linguistic identity of minorities within the respective territories and shall encourage conditions for the promotion of that identity, which we talked about this morning. So the elements are all there, and within the national context, the Malaysian context, rights as guarantee under the federal constitution, sometimes they overlap with international standards. Now, this in terms of legal jargon and phrases would be, would make up a case for us to knock at the door. And I'm asked to speak about rights of minorities in Malaysia. And sometimes I think it's a huge topic. I'm not able to do it within the span of 15 minutes, but I'm able to ask myself certain pertinent questions. What are the uh, contemporaneous issue? What are the issues now covering, bo uh, currently bothering us and uh, upon which we focus our attention? Now, while this subject can be huge and controversial, two issues that have stood is that have stood out in recent past, like a sore thumb to engage our attention, seems to be indigenous people's rights and those of a minority group identified by their sexual orientation and gender. Now, this morning when I talked to Ms. Rita, the expert on minority, I did ask her the question, you know, there is no agreed definition on the word minority. How do we go about it? And I, just, I did test myself against uh, what she has told us this morning and said, would I be wrong if I said I base it on, I base it demographically, where in terms of numbers, you're a small group, and then uh, you are being oppressed, and you move in a certain direction of identity where you talk about your group in terms of what you are and who you are. And uh, I'm glad she says it's okay to do that. Uh, not so much on the terminology, but go to the substance. Uh, look at the problematic area. Okay, if I'm wrong, please correct me, Ms. Rita. Okay, and the two contemporaneous issues that I'm going to turn to would be indigenous people's problems and LBGT's community. The problem of encroachment by authorities and loss of customary land, this is a huge problem in Semenanjung or Peninsula Malaysia, for example. I will just take one example to show you and elaborate the uh, se severity of the problem. The Orang Asli Silata, Orang Asli belongs to many other different type, uh, tribes. Okay, let's take uh, down south. The Orang Asli Silata in the coastal areas of Johor, for example, face sustained and continuous encroachment by state authorities as to their customary land. They are traditional fishing community and the decimation of mangrove swamps and pollution of rivers and coastal waters have threatened their livelihood and at risk of being put to extinction. There are nine orang asli Silata villages along the coastal belt of Johor, of which seven are located in the Iskanda development region. Only two villages have been partly gazetted 
as Aboriginal reserves under the Aboriginal People's Act 1954. The rest of more than 2,000 orang asli seleta live as squatters or illegal occupants on lands alienated to private entities without their free, prior and informed consent. Their customary rights over their own land were just ignored. Matters came to a head recently when there were attempts to desecrate their ancestors' graves and with that, an action against the state and federal government was filed at the Johor Bahru High Court. Rights to custom, customary land, and it is an established fact these days, are recognized by the highest courts in this country. They are supported in cases such as Adung Kawa and Sagung Tasi. Now, on top of this, violations in terms of customary land rights, you have further protection from the federal constitution and there are Article 5, which guarantees you the right to life. If you destroy a livelihood, you are violating a basic human rights, the right to life. Article 5 of the federal constitution so coincides with the covenants and declaration. And Article 8, equality, if you are going to take away my land, then it's not going to be a fair thing to do. Okay, that's what Article 8 says. You've got to treat people equally. And Article 13 of the Federal Constitu Constitution guarantees right to property. So you see an overlapping of international covenants, rights, and all that. And also... Uh, with the provisions under the federal constitutions. Now, the, what I'm trying to say is the Orang Asli Selata is just one example of the reckless manner in which Orang Asli customary lands and traditional livelihood are dealt with by the government. Elsewhere, if you talk about another tribe, the Orang Asli Termia face similar violations of minority rights. Alleged intrusion and logging still persists. Police reportedly burned down a blockade and arrested 13 orang asli termia in 2012. So it's a kind of land grabbing that is not allowed under the law, violation of human rights, both under the international governance and the federal constitution. Okay, and the burn, burning down of the blockades was a serious matter because it's an encroachment upon customary customary land. I am glad to say that a lawyer amongst us tried to help this 13 orang asli Termia and he's no, she's no other than our city Kasim, the chairperson. So she was an actor. She was not an, an onlooker just standing by and for helping the 12, the, uh, the 13 orang asli Tamiya, she got arrested that day by the police. But she was released later, of course. Now, what about situation across the South China Sea? Situation in Sabah and Sarawak, no better. Ancestral land appropriated by state authorities handed over to logging and palm oil companies were some of the complaints. Between 2002 and 2011, Suhakam, that is the national human rights body for those who are new in this country, Suhakam received 1,098 complaints that relates to native customary land rights. Of these 229 cases from Sarawak and 824 from Sabah, that's a whopping figure. This excludes the numerous court cases, not to mention stories of lies and deceit as related by members of Orang Asli and Orang Asal community. In East Malaysia, you call them Orang Asal. Now, development of native customary land must conform to the principle of free, prior and informed consent. You can't just go into people's land and take them away without consultation. 
That's the basic point. And this basic point is laid down in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People 2007. The acronym is UN DRIP. Now, this declaration is one that the Malaysian government has voted in favor. So we see a hypocrisy on the part of the Malaysian government in not honoring what they have voted. And it is hoped that the government will use the recommendations of the National Human Rights Body recently released national report on the land rights of indigenous people as a blueprint. Now, Suhakam have done a comprehensive report and uh, the expectations of people is it will be presented to parliament, debated upon and action and policies could be structured to give expression to the wishes of the Orang Asli people. Now, this exercise, as I know, involved about 6,000 over Orang Asli. It is hoped that it will be a blueprint to review their indigenous land policies and practices as a way forward. As I talk today, a task force was reportedly formed by the minister in the Prime Minister Department, Dr. Paul Lau, but time will tell on the efficacy or otherwise of much needed action. Now, that is one aspect of minority rights that I have touched upon, and uh, because of time constraint, I will move on to another area in, on this subject of minority rights, and it has been raised at the sideline this morning, that is rights of minority based on sexual orientation and gender. Now, if, you, if I were to use my yardstick so as to protect from being criticized and have unnecessary enlarged area, then I do not think I would go wrong because it is indeed an issue of an oppressed group in Malaysia. Now, it is disappointing to note that just day before yesterday, the Court of Appeal upheld the decision of the High Court in a matter on leave related to a decision by the police to ban a minority group, Sexuality Merdeka, on the basis of only police reports made against it. Ladies and gentlemen, this would have a very chilling effect on freedom of speech. It would have the effect of further eroding public space for discourse. We won't be able to gather to here to talk about it if the fear instilled by the police is felt by a large portion of the populace. Now, this erosion of public space for discourse is guaranteed under Article 10, Freedom of Speech, Expression and Assembly in our federal constitution. The police banning of an event, the sexuality medica, even before completing the investigating process, is wrong both in law and principle as public has a right to know the outcome of those investigations first. Since the allegations made by the complainants were that it is against public order, it will cause public disorder, and this sort of complaints tantamounts to hate speeches, and it is not allowed under the law unconstitutional. The amount of hate speeches is a shame to Malaysian all around. And it is directed at, at, at uh, sexuality Merdeka. So, that sets the tone for some kind of protection of this LBGT community from persecution. They suffer numerous hardships. And what are they? Harassment by Sharia and civil authorities, apart from being discriminated against, based on sexual orientation and gender identity in, in many departments. You go for a job, you may not get it. You suffer prejudices. People shy away from you. And people treat you like little things. And uh, it is even ironical when the police who are supposed to enforce this law, they are making, they are humiliating some members of this through unnecessary arrest and even detention. And they are also easy target of, of hate speech in the mainstream media. To them, life is no means free 
with this sort of harassment. The Sexuality Medica series reportedly is an event to present a platform for expression, engagement, and understanding of the LBGT community in Malaysia. For this, they are persecuted. True, there are those or even among us who disagree with the sexual orientation and gender identity. I accept that. It could be from a majoritarian, majoritarian viewpoint. But I say that it is exactly because of this disagreement, what more persecution, that this, that this group of minor, minority needs to be protected. Freedom and liberties, ladies and gentlemen, are not meant only for the majority. It is come possible to vote under a constitutional framework or a human rights regime. With that, thank you very much.